Yes, welcome back to ThinkTech, you know. And uh, we have Christine Linders with us. She's a physical therapist. The title of our show is Physical Therapy Above the Waist. <laughs> Very provocative. <laughs> and our tagline is what to do about shoulder injuries. We're going to learn about that today. But first, a little music to get you in the mood. <laughs> okay. The first song has to do with shoulders, of course. We're only going to sing 20 seconds of it. Ready, Christine? I'm ready, Jay. Put your head on my shoulder. Hold me in your arms, baby. Good. Have you thought about a music show? Never mind. <laughs> now you've embarrassed me. Another, another song later on. But I didn't know this actually opens up the whole idea about shoulders. It does. Shoulders are important. Shoulders are a part of our frame that's strong. It's, it's part of the, you know, the infrastructure of the human body. It is. It holds things. And therefore, so for example, put your head in my shoulders means, you know, I will support you. I will support you. It's a strong place. Strong place. We and carry then, things there. We carry things on our shoulders. Yeah. So it's important to keep our shoulders in good condition. It, it is. And if you know, if you don't, for example, if you're moving, you get this shot, moving like that, you know, you're going to you know, throw off the balance in the rest of your body. That's right. That's and right, that will affect you below the waist as That's well. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. That is true. So the next song is hmm, 57 Ways to Injure Your Shoulder, Just Like the Ketchup Bottle. Okay. That's right. Heinz 57 Sauce. There's 57 Ways to Injure Your Shoulder, and we definitely do not know them when we're going about our day. Okay. That's why we made this a very long show to go through. No, it's not 57 <laughs> Ways. You actually calculated it. How My palms ways? are sweating, Jay. <laughs> There's many ways to hurt your shoulder. There are usually ways that we don't think of when people hurt their shoulder, like carrying your purse always on one side. Oh, yeah. And then or you your briefcase. A briefcase that, or luggage. Or, or luggage. Like that. Yeah. Reaching in the backseat of the car. If you are the driver, you're always using that arm yes. to reach backwards. Yes. That puts yes. your rotator yes. cuff at risk. Yes. Talking on your phone all the time with your arm pinched in there takes the bicep tendon where it runs up across your arm into your shoulder joint and pinches it under the arch in your shoulder there oh, so that's a problem nervous, nervous reaction yeah well it's a tendon it's a tendon that gets pinched and that's where people get bicep tendonitis which oh, is yeah. a very painful thing up here in the front of your shoulder they also get bicep tendonitis if they're using their mouse on their laptop or without their arm supported or holding their phone out where the bicep tendon is always loaded. Those are times when you don't know you have tendonitis, so you wake up one day and you're like, oh my gosh, my arm hurts. You think, what did I do? But it wasn't like you just reached in the backseat of the car and said, ow. It was the, I sit with my arm out unsupported all day long using the mouse or using the Blackberry or tending to something while you're reaching. Some flight attendants will get it as they're pushing luggage up over and over and over again where that tendon gets pinched. You didn't just hurt it doing one thing, because when you do one thing, you know you hurt it, it hurts. You wake up, it hurts, and it hurts bad, and you're not sure why. And those are the 57 ways to hurt your shoulder that we need to call attention to so we could mix it up right to left, carry your purse on your left, switch to your briefcase switch. to your left. The mouse is difficult because desk setups are desk setups, and even for left-handed people, I know many of them, they eventually learn to use it on the right most times because of the way desks are set up and where things are. Some people shift it if they have pain in their arm and they'll yeah. learn to use it with their left to give their right arm a break. That's a little bit more challenging. Some of my best friends actually are, are left-handed. Smart people. Yeah. <laughs> my brother's left-handed. He is a smart I person. Could, I could show you how to be left-handed. But you know, this goes to the question of, so you're really saying in here, and we'll cover it in greater detail, is you have to switch or at least be mindful of the fact that you're pressing one side out that's correct, and so you should switch. That's the best thing, but what I think people need to know about it is when you're constantly having the right arm go forward or the left, if you're always doing things with your left, the ball in socket, it's like everybody refers to it as a golf ball on a tee because the socket is so small, it's not like this big. It's like this big, and so this big ball is sitting on this little tee, and so when you go forward, the ball goes forward. And all the muscles, your rotator cuff tendon, your supraspinatus that hold onto the ball is now like reaching forward to hold onto the ball, which puts it under constant strain, as well as when the ball most moves forward on the tee, the bicep tendon that is the number one uh, dynamic restraint 
to the shoulder moving forward is constantly under load. So the, muscle, the brain is giving messages saying, stay on, stay on, stay on. The bone is moving forward. We need a restraint to resist that bone moving forward. But when you are reaching forward all the You're time for the mouse, the you don't think about the ball moving forward. And over three or four or five years, the ball's forward. Your shoulder's a little bit more dipped forward on one side versus the other. And now you're setting yourself up for a risk for pain and injury, or you already have pain and injury. Are you saying not to play golf? No. Definitely play your sports. Golf, <laughs> tennis, go paddling, but go you surfing. Know, it's one side only. If I'm like a left-handed hitter, I'm a left-handed hitter. No, just, I'm a right-handed. You're right -handed. right-handed. Okay. Right. And, and I'm only on my right side. I'm stressing out the shoulder right here. So should I change to left-handed? No, that you shouldn't do, because that you're not doing for hours and hours and hours on end. You're not swinging a golf club for eight hours like you're reaching forward for your mouse button. You're doing it, and as long as you do some of these exercises that I'll show at the end today, you undo the sport, undo the task, undo the activity. So, the, excuse me, <clears throat> activity. So, when you can switch, like a purse, a briefcase, if you drive with one arm all the time, that's another one. I do like to drive with my left hand. I switch because it gets sore in the front of my shoulder. That's the bicep tendon. I'm pinching it because I'm up here. So you just switch. There's times when you could switch as you should. There's... This was a torture. <laughs> Wasn't, no, really. You know, that we, you're supposed to hold your arms out like I, that, like forever? I make that analogy to my patients where I say, there's contests at Oktoberfest where you hold a stein out here, yeah. and they give people like 100 bucks, whoever can hold it, but you yeah. watch. They all stand out here, yeah. and then they, it starts lowering, like and it starts lowering, and then they're like, oh, and they drop it because the tendon can't withstand the load for a long period of you time. You could hurt yourself that You way. could hurt yourself. So have you covered all the ways, you know, that we could have it? A shoulder injury? No, I mean, there's I other know ways. We didn't do 57, but maybe we did five. We did probably five or six, I think. And uh, reaching behind your back for women that do their bra, oh, that's one okay. of the complaints I get with people with shoulder injuries. And I know you can't understand <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, tr I'm troubled visualizing that, but okay. But you may have to help you. <laughs> well, what, well, what if that person isn't married, or what if they do live alone? And I've had five shoulder surgeries, so since I was 18 years old, yeah. I've had to hook it in the front and spin it around because my shoulders got repaired and I couldn't do it. And so I tell them, I know that's how you've always done it, but let me show you a new way. Switch them around. You will not hurt your shoulder that way, especially if your shoulder's already injured. You want to avoid some of those things that are aggravating it so that it heals, and then you can get back to doing it behind your back. But there's times that you need to avoid the irritating maneuver so that the tissue doesn't have any irritation on it so it can heal and get back to normal. You know, what, that, what this, this really teaches us, and I, you know, I think we should stress it, is that you have to be aware of how your body is working. In Movement. Terms of muscular, in terms of you know, skeleton and, you know, engagement. You have to think about these things Otherwise, you're going to wind up with a surprise. Huh? You do. Movement matters. I was going to plug the show. That's, that's going to be in the final exam. Movement matters. Movement matters. Yeah. If you're aware of how you move and you move better, you get to feel better. And that's what's important. Or you get to never have a shoulder injury because you're aware that your shoulder is forward than the other. People notice it in pictures that, oh, my gosh, I, I didn't see that before. I notice I've been getting more and more crooked. It is normal for the dominant There's arm to people, be a little some lower. Some people in Washington who, who already are completely crooked. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, so, <laughs> you know, one other thing that we should mention before we get off the, uh, you know, what causes uh, injury to shoulder yeah. is a simple, you know, traumatic accident. Yeah. Car accident, fall down. Yep. Uh, in so many ways, you could hurt your shoulder right, right there. You can hurt your shoulder and that way. Pretty serious injury. Serious injuries from falls could be uh, a fracture of, this is the humerus, the shoulder bone, a fracture of the humeral head, which is up here. You can shatter the bone. A lot of people break the humeral head when they fall. You can tear the other structures like your rotator cuff or the labrum, which is a cartilage ring that goes around the ball in the socket. You can tear those things from falls. Car accidents, same thing. Rotator cuff injuries, labral tears, sprains of the ligament, strains of the muscle. Any kind of trauma like that can create you know, a big-time shoulder injury. When we were kids, injury. we would bear each other. You know, we would say things like, give me all you got. And the idea was that one kid would, would take his fist to the other kid's shoulder and really suck him hard. And since the shoulder is a strong piece of gear, usually that wouldn't hurt a kid. 
but I can see it actually hurting a kid if you do it too hard. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that something that could you know, give you a serious injury? It can give you injury. It'll definitely traumatize the muscle in the region and start the process of inflammation. Young kids are tough, so the next day, whatever injury they have from a punch usually is gone unless it dislocates the shoulder because you actually punch it too hard, in which case that's going to be a serious injury mm, from a punch. You said something interesting I want to unpack. You said start the process of injury. It's yeah. kind of a, a process. It can be a, a process. A little bit of an injury can turn into a bigger piece of an injury, right? That is right. And that's what I tell people that come into the clinic. Sometimes they're in for something else like neck pain or back pain, and I'm talking to them about posture, and I'm noticing asymmetries in where their shoulders are. Now, the dominant side tends to be a little lower. That's normal, but they shouldn't be more forward. And when it gets more forward, that's when you have that process. Like, okay, I'm reaching to open up the fridge. I'm reaching to tie my shoes. I'm reaching to get you know, something so off the counter. So those trips to the fridge are a bad idea. Ice cream. On, on multiple levels. Stop yeah. doing it. <laughs> but that's the process is you have a little bit of a a little bit of a tinge in there that starts an inflammation process and you don't really know it's there because you don't have pain yet. It's not enough for your brain to register that there's something wrong. Then you keep doing normal everyday things, reaching for the fridge, reaching in the backseat of the car, working on your computer, holding your phone, doing dishes, picking up heavy pots, and pretty soon there's pain. Yeah. And you didn't know because you didn't fall. You didn't swing a baseball and say, oh, ow, that hurt my arm. You didn't do anything new where there was pain right away, so you don't know. Did I sleep wrong? Let me see. What did I do? Those are the process you injuries. you weren't thinking about it. You weren't in touch with your own shoulder. It was a little bit over time until the straw broke the camel's back. Well, let's talk about the straw and the camel's back. Suppose I do have a shoulder injury, and I, am, and I haven't watched this video, okay? okay. I haven't okay. watched this video. I know nothing about you know, this process that you're describing, and it keeps getting worse. And what is the worst case analysis for a little injury that I repeat the, you know, the bad mo motion? Uh, what can happen to me? Um, how, how bad can it get? It can get bad to where people feel like they can't use their arm. We use a pain scale 0 to 10, 10 is emergency room pain, and people come in and say, oh, my shoulder hurts so bad, I can't sleep at night. I can't even grab and turn the sink on. I can't pinch the button to like do my pants. That's where it gets so bad that you can cause micro tearing of say your rotator cuff tear ro rotator cuff that causes a little bit of a substance tear in the tendon or the muscle from that constant abuse and you need to people usually get you need shots. to be able to pull up your pants you that, need to be able to pull up your pants very important yeah. in this society I mean, in this, we do in this social world you know <laughs> it, it, you get terrible criticism you can lose your job and among other things yeah it is it is yeah that's something that we need to do but that's the problem with that is that now people can't use their arm and people can't work, people can't do the activities that they need, and sometimes you just shut the arm down, where That's serious. whatever activity, it's not that you need a sling if you don't have a tear, but you have micro tears that are causing this pain and inflammation. Shutting it down, meaning now you need to use your left hand to open up the fridge. So you need then to, you're imbalanced. You're imbalancing even more and putting the other one at risk while you heal this one, because as soon as you do the one activity that irritates your shoulder, now you're back to flaring it. You might have to shut it down for a week, you might have to shut it down for two. It might well, take three. How about, how about forever? Can this be no. a forever injury? I would like to say no. If we're causing repetitive injuries, no. Everybody's always that I've seen has been able to get back to doing what they want to do. It sometimes takes way longer for others. But my job, I'm working with people. When I get tendonitis of things, I back off, but I'm still working. So I try to take it easy the best I can. And it takes longer for me because I'm still using both of my arms. Mm -hmm. But if you had a desk job, you could support your arm. You could rearrange things. You could carry the briefcase in the other hand. You could lighten the load and only take the it's bare part minimum. Of consciousness thing. It okay, is. we're going to take a short break. Okay. We're going to do some neat little division into you know what 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 is a shoulder injury, how you avoid having a shoulder injury, and and if we get back from this break, okay, I want I want to talk about how you fix them. Okay. With physical therapy. Okay. All right. This is very important. And we do have pictures. We'll be right back. Thanks to our Think Tech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Mun Lee and the Friends of Think Tech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, 
the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Christine Linders, write that down. This is all going to be in the final exam. Okay, so Christine, let's assume we have, you know, a shoulder injury. Yep. Let's assume we were not conscious at the time we got it. I mean, of a body movement, not conscious that it was getting worse. And here we are, and we need some heavy lifting. That's a bad expression. Yeah. <laughs> we, need some, we need some serious, you know, correction right. of our, of, for healing of our shoulder injury it can get to be a real pain, yep. okay? So what can you do with the magic of physical therapy to make my shoulder better, yeah? Yes, so when you Don't come- Don't forget your pictures. I won't, so before we get to the pictures, when you come into the office, I pay attention to things like one shoulder being more forward than the other, or your shoulder blade in the back. I put you through a range of motion to see what it looks like if it's performing optimally because a lot of times the muscles in the back get weak as you're using your arm forward and you don't know it because they're back there you don't think of them and a lot of oftentimes you have to strengthen those to make the front part or the outside part feel better mm. so what i can do when you get to the clinic the first thing i usually go after is the pec minor that's a muscle that attaches from the front of your rib cage into the front of your shoulder blade, which is in the back, but there's this little bone that sticks out that it attaches to, and when it gets short, because you're reaching forward, holding it's your between phone. Between my arm and my chest, right? Yeah, you feel it right there. If I you got poke, it, I got it, yeah. I got it right there. That's yeah, the one. Yeah, yeah. So I, if you release that, pretty soon the shoulder that was forward like this is now sitting back where it should be, and then the shoulder blade in the back is now sitting on the rib cage where it should, it be. should so, be. There's no more tension on your bicep tendon and no more rotator cuff that's reaching out to hold that bone. What do you say? You said release. How do you release oh, it? Oh, I like, I'll do some soft tissue massage to it to loosen it up. It usually feels, uh, I check both sides because I want the person to know that I'm not just going after something that is not a problem. And I don't think I've ever had someone that I poked in their painful side that they said, ooh, that feels good. They usually say, oh my gosh, why does it only hurt on that side? And I explain that. That's a tip off right there. That's the tip off. And I want you to know when you're laying on my table that that's why I'm going to go after that and help to resolve it because your other side, while it may be a little tender, doesn't feel anywhere close to as bad as a side that's affected or painful. But no question. Yes. Just suppose I go for this, what is it again? Soft tissue massage or mobilization, okay. we call it. And we find, to our amazement after watching this video, that they both tight. I loosen they them both, both up. Huh? I loosen them both up. Because in that instance, I'm usually looking at someone that's sitting kind of rounded like this. Uh, so their pec minors are going, pectoralis is the name uh, of the muscle, uh, pectoralis minor. It is going to be in a shortened position, prolonged if they're like that. So I have them lay down. I have a picture at the end, and I'll show you where I just loosen people and, and listen to them. Oh, yeah, that's sore. But oh, afterward, yeah. they all get up and say, oh, my gosh, wow, I feel more open. They, open is the most commonly heard thing after I loosen up someone is I feel more open. Yeah, right. I right. need to enable open. them to get up here because we can try to make you sit up straight all day long. But if you've got these two little muscles holding you like this, it's just it's hard it to get up there. Posture. It affects and your, your posture. posture is so important, you know, for everything. Your state of mind, among other things. Everything. So you're, you're kneading the muscle there. I need the muscle. Wait, okay. I loosen it up. I stretch it. Sometimes I bend it back and forth. I'll get lotion and loosen it up. Depends on how tender. If someone's very tender, I go very easy. Yeah. I'm not trying to make you suffer. Yeah. So Regardless suffering the, is not necessarily an answer here. No, suffering is no. not the answer. So, the mnemonics for PT have been pain and torture, you know, physical. They have all different names for therapists that yeah. involve torturists. And so... <laughs> Oh, I'm going You're to my PT. That. I, yeah, it, it's going to hurt. I tell them, it, if this hurts, I'm sorry. Just, I'm just going to go as easy as I can. You let me know when you need a break. And we don't have to fix it today. How long does it take you to, to need it so that, you know, I feel 
you know, open? Anywhere from two to three minutes to five or six minutes. And I don't usually blast away in one shot. I try to give them enough because the tissue likes to be open. It gets blood flow and circulation, more stretchiness, extensibility, we call it, so that the next time they come, I can do a little bit more. It's a process to undo uh, it as well as it is a process to do it. Uh, next time they come. Let's dwell on that. Yeah. So when is the next time and what happens between time one and time two? Okay, so for... Time one, I will loosen up their area. And then can we get to a picture that's later in the order? Made that call. Okay, so let's go to picture number five. Okay, so picture number five. This is a model laying on a rolled up towel on a wall. So I will release- Do you release... need the wall to do this? No, but a foam roller is helpful. A half of a foam roll, but the whole foam roll needs to run from your head down to your buttocks. So, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's running down. It's not across like, your back. It's, it's down your back. It's straight down your back. It's yeah. hard to see because the towel squished. Yeah. But a half foam roller that's 36 inches, which runs from your head to your buttocks, yeah. or this a full one. Circular. Circular one, yeah. Or, or could it be a, a, a semicircle? Circular or semicircle. Doesn't matter. Absolutely. Semicircular right. okay. I'll use for older people because it's a little bit tough to get on the full roll. They can yeah. put the half one on their bed it's and not worry about balancing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I stretch them out sometimes on this. Mm -hmm. Depends on who's there and their age and all that. Muscle extensibility. And then I will stretch them out on this and have them do deep breaths because your pectoralis minor does attach to your ribs. Breathe in, the muscle gets tight. Breathe out, it's no well, more. Breathing is breathe part in. of this too. Breathing is always part of exercise, isn't it? Breathing is always part of exercise. Breathing, we can't do anything if we don't breathe. <laughs> You know, that's <laughs> definitely going to be on the final exam. If you can't get that one, you're in trouble. That's right. Breathing is can't something. can't do anything if you don't breathe. That's true. I apologize for that. So after that, we're still in the first session. After that, I'll go to picture number six. Okay. But that's it. So now, if you have the range of motion and you don't have a rotator cuff tear or shoulder pain, I'll have them rotate their hands back, uh -huh. pressing their hands towards the floor, which now is an inhibitory stretch to the pectoralis minor and major and also squeezes the shoulder blade. So now we're starting to re-educate. So I will send them home with something like this, whether they lay on the floor, lay on the bed, try to start stretching out. They can stand up against the wall and do that as well, which is picture number four. So now you're at work and you want to try to squeeze your shoulder Wait blades. This person looks very familiar to me. You know, I use all kinds of doppelgangers for myself. Because I feel like then people can't she really tell you. Quintuplets in her family. I don't have to have them sign a release if they look someone like me. Oh, very good. Know? So that you could squeeze your hands back, squeeze your shoulder blades back into a wall. If you're at work, if you're at home, if you're out in a shopping mall and you're having trouble, you could squeeze back. And that's the part of re-educating. After I stretch out the front, now you need to start re-educating the back. To be more advanced now, fast forward to your question, what do I do on the second visit? Now that they're a little bit looser, I've released some things so their shoulder pain is less or hopefully at least gone when they're at rest. I will now give them something like picture number seven, which is something with a band or not. It, oh. So now you could see the shoulder blade squeezed in the back. So what people, I think oftentimes, the ones I see in the office anyway, don't realize is, oh, wait, I don't realize... I have to use the back muscles to save the shoulder. So all the muscles on the back of your shoulder blade to the right and to the left, they are the rotator cuff muscles and they attach to the shoulder, the ball, the ball on the socket. The muscles in between the shoulder blades, right in the middle of the back where you could see the little wrinkles, those are the muscles that control the shoulder blades. Now we have muscles that control the shoulder blades in the center, muscle that controls the shoulder on the backs of the shoulder and blades. helping your posture. You're and, helping your posture. And, and opening you up. Yeah. Opening you up. Now I've given you space to move your shoulders back in the front by releasing those tissue. Now you start to strengthen and re-educate those tissue. Not everybody can use the band. If someone rotates out and they have that, pain. That orange thing is the band. It's that's the, stretchy, the band. It's the stretchy. That's the stretchy band, yeah. So you're stressing the, the, mo the back muscles all the more because of the band. That's right. It's, yeah. like, it's like weightlifting, but I use a very light band in the beginning because they did have a shoulder injury. So, and those are right. shoulder muscles too. So I don't want any pain. This is not a no pain, no gain. The, <laughs> there's pain free that should exercise to be, or I take the band away and say, only open your hands as far as you don't have shoulder pain. 
we start there. I've had people where we had to start with a squeeze and only open the hands a little bit. And then the next couple of times, then they say, oh my gosh, I can open it now. Let me try a band. And it's I can a do process. this at home just as well. You could do it at home. You could do it in the car. You could do it sitting right there. I should have brought a band. I am doing it sitting right there. Good. See? Yeah. So how many times do I have to do it for, you know, for it to have the right effect? So most people don't need to do it very much. Five to ten times. What? Just one set of reps? No. Ah. I tell people that are at a desk, I say, I don't care what you do every hour. If you do one or two with or without the band, then you go back to your desk. One or two later, back to your desk. Some people will do 10. They'll say, no, I'm going to take, I'm going to do 10 three times a day. I'll do it at 10 after I've been working for two hours. I'm going to do it at one after lunch when I go back to my desk. And I'm going to do it at four right before I go home. So everybody's different how and when they will do these exercises. And I try to find out from them. What is best for you? Is it better to do two of these, two of these, or will you have time in your day that you can actually take 15 seconds and do 10 and then go back to work? Re-educating the proper posture, re-educating. Yeah, alarm clock or something. Notifies timers, you. Yeah, phones, time, yeah. watches, everything. Computers have programs that you could set alerts like stand up, walk around for three seconds. Oh. There's, there's things, there's apps and everything that you can set up on computers. I use all of those. Whatever someone has, I said, set a timer and keep resetting this it. This sounds like something you could do for carpal tunnel, too, no? With the bands? No, standing up every 10 minutes. Standing up and giving yourself a break. Yeah. With the carpal tunnel things, people tend to have their hands moving all the time, like you see me doing. Yeah. And so it's helpful to take a break. So if you are typing all the time and you're resting that area around the carpal tunnel over your, um, the little bumpers they have right before you yeah, the yeah, keyboard, yeah. If you're resting it on there while you're talking to someone, don't. Take your hand off and rest it. Or yeah. hang it down. Let the, let the arm rest. You just don't want to keep anything com 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 compromising and compressing the area of the copper tunnel. But we don't think about that while we're resting. We just keep our hands on the laptop while we're talking. Just take them off and give them a break. Okay, a dark side now. Dark side. So I know a guy not too long ago. He had to have surgery. He had to have surgery on his uh, rotator cuff, which yeah. happens. I mean, it it, it's an aging thing maybe or something. I don't know what he did to deserve that, but yeah, <laughs> and he was walking around with a sling for a long time. So how does that happen? And what is the relationship between the kind of injuries that we talked about here yeah. and you know, a need for surgery on his rotator cuff? Yeah, so did he injure himself or did he just have one of those, oh, I don't know how I did it, my shoulder hurts. And I, yeah, so I don't know how I did it, my shoulder hurts. Now I have a rotator cuff tear is usually a repetitive injury where you're doing something, reaching all the time, and then you're reaching in the back seat, and then you're sleeping on that arm or you're sleeping with your arm up here, and that's compressing the rotator cuff up under that bony arch, and it gets some sort of internal impingement where the bone up here, that bumpy bone on the top of your shoulder, underneath it is poking into the soft tissue, creating over time, like, like macerating a steak or something. It creates micro tears uh -huh. that leads to an eventual weakening of that rotator cuff muscle. And then you go to pick up your soda bottle, and boom, you have a rotator cuff tear. It's just been waiting to happen. How Little can you tell that it's that rather than, uh, you know, muscular tightness? I ask questions, and when you come in to see me, so sometimes I don't see people before surgery. So they're coming in after surgery, and they're in the sling, and their shoulder is forward, and they're pectoralis muscle is now short and their shoulder blade is winging off the back which some people have seen I don't have a photo of that I used to have it and now I've strengthened myself so I <laughs> I tried to provide that for you guys but I'm sorry next time but the shoulder blade is winging off the back because of the position of that short pectoralis minor and being in the sling so at that point I don't know were they like that before until I start rehabilitating their shoulder getting them range of motion getting them into the back posture and then asking them more questions about did you hurt your shoulder did it come on over time? Were you always doing this at work? What, what was their task? Are you a baseball player? Are you talking on your phone all the time? Is there a hobby that you like to do that puts your arm like that all the time? And now it broke down because of wear and tear. I find that out through the process of my interview with them. What I hear you saying is probably if you, before you rush off and have your rotator cuff, uh, you probably ought to see a physical therapist to make sure that it, this Absolutely. isn't something that can be corrected with a lot less uh, invasive procedure, whatnot. Yeah. That's the main point right there. <laughs> Write that down because... That's on the final exam. That's the too. final exam. Not because I thought so, because she thought so. If you have a rotator cuff tear, go see a physical therapist. 
Fix your posture, get the re-education exercises, even if it's without a band, to normalize the position of your shoulder, strengthen the muscles on the back of your shoulder before you consider getting to the tear because there's things called copers and non-copers. I've seen people with massive rotator cuff tears that went in for the day of surgery for their like pre-op with the nurse, and that day they said, well, wait, how's your shoulder? And one of my patients in New York City said, oh, well, it's, it's fine. I've been doing some strength training. I didn't meet him before, and now I'm fine. And she went, I think we should cancel the surgery. She had him raise his arm. It was fine. And she oh, told him, you like that? you're a coper. So he came into physical therapy with me later so I could show him more things so he can continue to do everything that, like that he did. And he didn't hurt himself. He just was aware <laughs> and tear. But it was one of those massive through and through tears that need surgery. You would think most people would need surgery. But there's copers and non-copers. Sometimes so try things PT are not first. what they seem to be. That's right. That's Christine Linders. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to see more of her, right? Christina is going to do her own show about this, yes. and uh, we're going to see a lot of other kind of it. below the waist and above the waist, and 57 things to do this and 57 things to do that. I'm really looking forward to that. Okay, the same here. Christine Linders, wow, physical therapist, wow. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank this. you, Jay. Perfect. I'm so.